I will wait for uh, three, four minutes to have more people in the call. Okay, so the first thing is uh, last time we decided that the meter is on Monday, November the 9th, right? So if everybody is okay with that date, we'll go with that date. Uh, if you have a conflict, uh, please do let me know right? as early as possible. Okay, so again, there's, uh, it's not easy taking exams at those times. But if you need some uh, special accommodation, uh, letting me know early is a lot more easier than letting me know, you know, the day before the midterm, okay? All right, so that's the day we have for now. Again, Monday, November 9th, right? So it's a, a fairly standard midterm format, right? So questions, do some calculation, provide an answer. Okay. So anything about the midterm? That uh, you are, that's one discuss. Okay, so if not, let's uh, recap what happened last time. All right, so last time we talked about capacitance. So, where does capacitance come from? Right, so capacitance come from the fact that when we have a charge, say Q, we set up an electric field. Right, so this creates some. Let's say some field. Okay. What the field does is creates, for example, a potential difference, a potential difference V. And whenever you have some charge that has a voltage potential difference, this leads to capacity. Okay. Or from a circular perspective, we're going to look at this as a capacitor. We're gonna look at this as a capacitor. So again, the way we do this calculation, okay, so let's uh, think about what voltage do we care about? Okay, what voltage do we care about? So if we have two lines, one carrying Q, one carrying minus Q, right? So one is the wire, one the return wire. Then what we want to know, right? What we want to know as the, for example, the voltage difference between the two wires, right? Our system essentially uh, the wires or the conductors we have in the transmission line, 
So when we want to compute something like the voltage, we want to know the voltage between the wires. Or equivalently, we want to know the capacitance between the wires. Okay, this is what we want to know. Okay. So see here, basically, we have two charges or two sources of charge. Right, we have two sources of charge because we have two wires, right? two conductors. So there are two sources. And we want to compute the impact of, of these, both of these sources on the voltage, okay? on the voltage between the two wires. And then if you look at three phase, which we'll look at today, so three phase lines basically is, right, three phase is that we'll have three wires and we want to know the impact on voltage with all with respect to all three wires. Okay. So this is the uh, capacitance, right? So to calculate capacitance, I need to know voltage. And uh, to know voltage, I need to basically sum across all the sources that carries charge. Okay. So the equation we'll use, the equation we covered from last time, we'll use again, it's important to uh, go through this again, as Let's we'll take the following, okay, so uh, terminology, okay, terminology. The terminology goes like this. We'll look at K and I. These are the lines we want to measure voltage. Okay, lines want to measure the voltage difference. Okay, so for example, I have two conductors wires, one carrying Q, one carrying minus Q. So we call one of them K, one of them I. Okay. So what we care about is something like VKI. Okay, once we want to measure the voltage you know, between K and I. Then we'll induct something M Okay, M indexes, M indexes the conductors carrying charge. Okay, so M indexes all the conductors that carries charge. So for example, we have conductor one, conductor two, conductor all the way to capital M. There's wires that carries charge. So for, for those two wire system, Q and minus Q, we have two conductors that carry charge. And the, what we have is the way to compute the voltage, the way to compute the voltage potential difference between K and M is to sum up the impact of all the charge carrying, all the, all the charge carrying conductors. So the total voltage right, between these two is one over two pi epsilon. So this is the common factor we always have. We're gonna look through all the charge carrying conductors from one to capital M. Each of them carries a charge QM, okay, some charge QM. And the impact on the voltage is the log, natural log of the distance from I to M over the distance from K to M. This is the equation we have. Okay, so this is the, okay, so if you look at this equation, this is each, each individual term is the contribution of the voltage from a particular conductor. Because this is a linear system, now we're gonna sum all of this. Okay, we're gonna sum all of this. Right? Okay. So that's the equation we have. And the way to use this equation is to figure out, you know, what is the right number to plug into it. So now let's look at the two wire, single phase two wire thing again, just as a review to look at what are the right, okay, so never mind, this is wrong sign. All right, so let's look at the, this situation again. Okay, so let's look at the situation where we have two wires 
right? So with some radius, one carrying say Q, one carrying minus Q. And the voltage difference we want to know between the two wires, as the voltage difference on the surface of this wire to the voltage difference on the surface of the other wire. Okay? And we're gonna call this point X, call this point Y. Okay? So if you read the book, this X and Y is used for many times. So this notation is overloaded. So it's both used for, to denote wires and the potential difference between two points on the surface of the wire. Okay, so that's the way the notation is. So we can think of X and Y as, y, as conductors. Okay? And when we compute the voltage difference between two conductors, we're computing the voltage difference between two points on the surface of the conductor, okay, of the points on the surface of the conductor. And what we want is we want, want to compute Vxy. Okay, we want to compute this voltage between point X and point Y. Okay. So there's two contributions to this, right? There's two contributions to this voltage. This is the contribution Vxy is basically the voltage difference caused by conductor X plus the voltage difference caused by conductor Y. These are the two parts of the equation we have. Both wires create some uh, potential difference. And for us, we're gonna just sum them up. Okay? We're not gonna sum them. Okay? So let's look at uh, the first term, okay? So the Vxy carried by conductor x. This is q two pi epsilon. Right? This is this doesn't change. Log. So now you look at this equation. Dim. Right. So here with dim is how far y is from x. Right. So it's here we're looking at vki. DIM over DKM. Here M is the X conductor. I is point Y. Okay, so here what we write down is DYX over DXX. Right? So DYX is how far away Y is from conductor X. DXX is how far away the point is from the center of the Y. So that's the way we think about this. So, right, so here we have this is center, this is x, this distance is the x x. Is this clear so far? Is this getting clear? Okay. So all of the, right. So we basically have one equation to plug in this equation, and the uh, idea is just to identify all the indices in this equation. Okay. So identify them correctly. Then we can keep going. We can look at V, X, Y, where the contribution come from conductor Y. From conductor Y, the charge carrying is minus Q because it's a return wire, so it's minus Q. Log, so what is this log now? This is how far Y is, the point Y is to the conductor Y. So this is Y, Y, this is the y x or the x y sorry so okay so this is the equation we have so when you add them when you add these two parts we're going to add right? and i have a minus sign in the log uh, in front of the log so you can do the uh, logarithm tricks Afterwards, you got Q two pi epsilon log of the y x the x y the x x the y y. Okay, so when you just add, you get this equation. Now, of course, for these two wires, d y x equals the x y. Right, there's a distance between x and y. One x is the same. It's symmetrical. Call this d. Okay. Assuming the wire have the same. 
radius, call this R. Then what we get, uh, this is Q over pi epsilon log of D over R. This is just the equation we have at the end of the day. Right, we have D squared over R squared, two comes out of the log, and uh, cancels the two on the bottom. So this is the equation we have, right? So this is for the two wire case, we'll compute the voltage. Computing the comparisons is easy, it's just uh, Q over this voltage, right? So any questions for this? All right, so what we're gonna do today, we're gonna do this, we're gonna repeat this calculation for the three phase, right? When we have three wires. We're gonna look at what happens when we have three wires. What happens when we sum all this up? Okay, so it's slightly more complicated because it's not Q and minus Q. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, could you go over again how the how the values in the natural log uh, were okay. chosen? Uh, how the values are chosen? Okay, so or I guess just like why dy why dyx over dxx? Oh, why this? Okay, so let's go through this again, right? So let's look at our equation up here, right? So here, I is, right, so let's look at k. k is x, right? We're computing the voltage from x to y. So we're gonna plug into this equation, k is x, i is y, and m is x. For the x for the x conductor, okay? okay. Then, if you look at the distance, then d i m this is the distance from y to x, right? So this is d y x. We're computing the impact of this conductor on the voltage between x and y. So the first distance we use is how far y is from this point. Okay, that's the first is how far y is from x. That's the first uh, thing we use. And then the second term is the km. This is the distance from x to the center of x conductor. Okay, right. So this is a small distance in between, and this creates a voltage that we see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is the voltage we see. Okay. Okay. So, as uh, so a standing day check, let's think of whether this makes sense or not. Okay, let's think of whether this makes sense or not. So, what happens? Right. Let's look at this one term in this voltage stuff. So if y is very far from x, y is very far from x, is the voltage difference bigger or smaller between x to y? Let's say I'm looking at the conductor x. Okay? I'm looking at some conductor x. Y is very far away. And I want to compute the voltage from x to y. Is the vo should the voltage be large or small? The potential difference be large or small? Larger. Should be larger, right? Because the integrating more steel. Okay, y is really far away, so it doesn't get much of the field, and we're going to integrate this whole field. Okay. 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 So then if you look at this point x, as we move the point x to the charge, what happens is the electric field become larger and larger, right? become larger and larger. So if, as, if x is very close to the center of the conductor, then the voltage is also larger because you pick up more field as you move to the center of the charge. Okay. So what happens if you go right at the charge? What is the field strength right at the charge? Right, so if you look at the classical equation, it's infinity, because field decays as one over the distance. So one over zero is infinite, right? It seems like we should have infinite uh, field at the charge. So this is where the equation breaks down. That's where you need quantum mechanics to work out it. But for us, for us, you know, if you know the wire is of any radius, it's fine, right? So that's why we cannot take the point X to be directly in the center of the conductor. Okay, that equation don't work if you do it that way. So we need the X to be on the surface of the conductor okay, for this equation to make sense, right? So that's the 
two distance we have. Good. Any other questions about this? All right. Okay, good. So let's look at uh, our three wire case. Okay, let's look at our three phase line, right? So again, the first, so we'll make the assumption that these are symmetric. Okay, if they're not symmetric, then the uh, calculation becomes a lot more uh, tedious, I guess. It's not that more difficult, but it's very tedious. Okay, so we're gonna make, we're gonna assume symmetry. Basically, they're in a triangle, equilateral triangle form. All the wires are the same, same radius. All the distance between the wires are the same. Okay, just for simplicity, we'll make a symmetry assumption. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll ignore the fact that we have a ground, the actual Earth. Right? I just ignore what the actual Earth is there. So Earth, you know, the actual ground Earth also has some impact on this, but we'll ignore that. Okay? that that's uh, typically smaller than the impact of the lines on themselves. If there is a neutral conductor, we'll ignore that neutral conductor. Okay? Because we're gonna assume that neutral conductor conducts zero charge, right? Because three phase, all the charge adds to zero. So if there is a neutral, we're gonna ignore that neutral. So all we have left over are the charge carrying ones, which is ABC conductors, okay? okay. So let's look at our equation and look at what happens. Okay. So let's look at the, okay, so let's go, this is our old equation, which we use. This is sort of the basic equation we use. So let's first look at the voltage from A to B impact by all three conductors. Okay, let's look at the VAB first. Okay, let's look at this first. Let's plug into our equation and see what happens. Okay. Okay. So again, so if you plug in this equation, what we have is VAB. We're going to factor out the common two pi over epsilon term. We have the charge carried by A, log of how far B is from A over the distance from a point on the surface of conductor A to the center of conductor A. So DAA, to be clear, as a distance All right, so I have conductor A, this is DAA. So as a point on the surface to the center, plus QB log of DBB over DAB. QC log of DBC over DAC, okay, right? So the last term comes from C, right? So we're looking at the impact of C on the voltage between A and B. So let's look at this equation. First, some nice thing will happen, right? So what is the, what is DBC over DAC? What happens to this term? Right, so the thing inside the log is one, right? Log of one is zero. Okay, so this is QC log of one is zero. Right? Because we assume, so C is equal distance from to A and B. So C has no impact on the voltage difference between A and B. Okay, so there's a lot of assumptions. That our assumption of everything being symmetric basically allows us to, uh, you know, eliminate a lot of terms, okay? So this equation, you'll know it has three logs in it. It will become easier because we'll do a lot of substitution. We'll say R as the radius, which is all the same. All the distance between the wires, between the conductors is capital D, okay? So what we have left over is VAB, one over two pi epsilon QA log of, D over R plus QB log of R over D plus QC natural log of D over D. This is zero, it's a log of one. So this is two pi epsilon 
QA log B over R plus QB log R over B. Okay. Right. So this is what we have. We get rid of the last term. We make the uh, symbols easier for us to work with. Okay. All right, so this is VAB, right? But this is three phase, so let's compute VAC. Okay, let's compute VAC because we're not done with uh, just one. So let's look at VAC, okay, right? So for example, what we want to do is we want to make a single phase equivalent circuit. So we basically need to average what happens between A and B and what happens between A and C. Okay, that's what we need to do. So this is the same step, exact same steps as before, where you swap out B and C. Right, so this calculation are exactly the same. Wherever you see B, you put in C. So at the end of the day, we have V and C. This is one over two pi epsilon QA log B over R plus QC log R over B. Right, so this is, right, so compare this equation to this equation. All the difference is the subscript. One has QB in it, one has QC in it, right? because everything else is exactly symmetrical. Exactly symmetrical. So nice thing will happen, right? Because we get the spell in three phase. So nice thing, so we have, you know, nice things is gonna happen. So let's uh, look at how we make nice things happen. Okay? So we'll eventually make this equation fairly easy to understand. Okay? All right, so, Remember, we are looking always looking at a balanced three phase system. Okay? Our system always balanced three phase. So let's look at the voltage, right? So the VAB voltage. This is right. So remember, look at this two equation, right? So we have VAC, right? So VAB. Just for completeness, let's write it here. R QB log R over D, okay. And we, for a single phase equivalent, we need to relate VAB and VAC to a line to neutral voltage, right? To get a single phase equivalent. So let's try to get that from this. So VAB, this is root three, VAN. What is the angle? What is the angle difference between line to line and the line to neutral? 30 degree at once. Right, 30 degrees. So this plus 30 degrees, positive 30 degrees. So, okay, so this is writing it out out. Root three VAN, root three over two plus J one half. Okay, so that's just the equation we have. VAC, this is root three, VAN. And this is negative 30 degrees. This is just the flip, happens to be flips a sign. Root three, VAN, root three over two minus J one half. So if you do this, what you observe is you add VAB plus VAC. So we're almost there. We're gonna we'll do addition very soon. But uh, this, if you just add them up, this is three V. The imaginary parts cancels out, right? And uh, you have one half. You have three over two plus three over two. So this gives V A N as one third V A B plus V A C. So this is the equation we have, and we're very close, okay? Because what we're gonna do is we're just gonna sum these two. Okay, so we eventually will sum this. Okay, so what it tells us we can sum this to get Vn, because Vn is one third Vab plus Vac. All right, so let's do our sum. We're gonna do our sum. So this is VAB, VAC, VAN. If you sum it, you got this equation. It's just uh, straightforward. 
But this is, there's one more, there's one more simplification we can do. Right? If you look at this equation, what is QB plus QC? Right, this is boundary. QA. This is negative QA. Okay, so we can have one more cancellation terms. Okay. Or not one more. We are good. We're gonna have one more terms in here. That's QA. Okay. So QB plus QC log of R over D. This is minus QA log R over D or QA log D over R. Right. Okay. So what happens is the one third will go away. Okay, the one third goes away. So after all this work, what we have is VAN as one third, one over two pi epsilon, two QA log D over R plus another QA log D over R. The three cancels, so you get a very, I guess, anticlimactic answer, one over two pi epsilon, QA log D over R, <laughs> both. Right, so this is what we get. If you sum out of it, a single phase, you know, equivalent voltage or the line to neutral voltage is just uh, has one term in it, which is log D over R. And so all the other, the impact of the other conductors basically all average itself. Okay, they, they cancel in exactly the right way. And then we can get capacitance very easily. Right, so to get capacitance, what we have is VAN as this term. Capacitance as Q over V. And uh, you get two pi epsilon over log of D over. Okay, this is just the what equations comes out to be. And by symmetry, all of them are equal. Okay, all, all the capacitance are equal. So basically, if you look at three phase, what we do is the first three phase becomes a single equivalent capacitor. And this capacitance is given by two pi epsilon log of D over R. So we have a single phase equivalent circuit with this capacitance here. Okay. All right, so any questions up to here? So, so VAN equal to the one third of VAB plus VAC. Yes. Uh, yes. Can, can go back one more slide? Go back. Yes, here. Um, yes, VAB is always. Yeah, just add sort of the imagined part cancels out. Okay. Right, so balance three phase turns out to be really important, right? So if you took 351, you know, you think why do we all make a balance three phase? This is the reason. Try doing this calculation when it's not balanced. Okay, try doing this. You will get a nine by nine matrix so you have to do something to. Okay, so if you take distribution system, what your capacitance is no longer one number. Okay, so balance three phase, the capacitance is a single number. Okay, this, epsilon over log D over R. You look at distribution system, because it's not balanced and the lines cannot be equally spaced. It's very hard to make the lines equally spaced. Where your capacitance will look like is a nine by nine matrix. You have to carry that thing around to do all this calculation. Okay, so there's quite a lot of uh, sort of the savings come from the balance phase. Okay, just because everything cancel, everything else. And uh, we can look at a single number when we have three phase line. Okay? So for distribution, the story is no longer, for distribution system story is not this simple. Distribution systems, a lot of our effort goes in identifying the sort of this matrices that characterize sort of the mutual capacitance between everything to everything. We're asked for balance three phase, there's a number to worry about and the number turns out to be particularly simple. Okay, just the distance divided by the radius of the line. 
So, right, so balance three phase is important. A lot of this because so with such that we can do calculations. Okay, this unbalanced three phase entire, you know, take us 10 lectures or many lectures to get just to get the comparison and inductance uh, matrix correct. Okay. Balanced three phase just happens to be easy because things can't. Okay. All right. So thank God for Tesla. I don't know if Tesla knew any of these, right, when he invented balanced three phase, the multi-phase systems, but he has amazing intuitions of things will work out much, much easier. Okay, so as a, you know, before him wasn't really any phase or something, you just have a wire and return wire, and uh, things was, you know, a lot more complicated. And he said, hey, why don't we just do this balanced three phase thing? And uh, things just worked out. So the calculation was worked out a lot later than way the system was built. But the, the, now if you think about the reason, there's a lot of reason that things will cancel in three phases. Any other questions on this? All right, so Right, so how do we make balance system more balanced, right? So if we had a uh, unequal spacing, right? So maybe we cannot have, you know, a triangle all the time. But let's say the lines are flat, then we'll again transpose a line. Okay, we'll transpose a line to make them look more balanced or look more symmetric. And again, the effective or the equivalent distance and now the geometric mean of the three distances we have. Okay? So if you keep transposing lines, then over a long run, the average, the distance between every phase will be equal to every other phase. And the effective distance is, you know, is just a geometric mean. Right? That's the, the on average how far away the lines look to, to each other. All right, so that's why we do transposing. Again, to make our lives a lot easier. Okay. All right, so, and the last thing we can do is we have bundle conductors. And bundle conductors, again, are not that much more complicated, right? Now, bundle conductors, all we do, the equation okay, stays the same. The equation stays the same. The equation stays the same. What we do is instead of D, Go to some equivalent D okay, between the distance between them. And instead of, so I say R, this goes to a equivalent as C, right, the surface to the conductor distance. And this is the equivalent radius of a bundle. Okay? This is the equivalent radius of a bundle. So you still you always use this equation. Okay? This is the key equation we'll use. And then we'll substitute the equivalent distance, right? And we'll substitute the sort of the equivalent radius, equivalent radius for the actual radius. Okay? So all you have to do is to you know remember basically the equations on this slide, which on this slide. Okay? So, so there was some complaint about my handwriting being hard to read, which I agree. So I will try to type so this equation if important equations. So I'll try to you know, both derive them and have a typed out version uh, in case you want to reference them today. Okay, so these are the equations. And now the DSC just depend on the configuration of the bundles. So you have you know, two, two conductors in the bundle. That's this equation, three conductors, that equation, four conductors as you know, the equation underneath this. Okay. Again, comes down from a geometric mean. I was just taking geometric means of distances. Any question with respect to this slide? All right, so for this is an important slide to remember, uh, to know where to find, right? If you're doing questions. Let's ask you to find the uh, 
conducts it. Okay? So that's uh, the important slide. Okay, so all the equations basically here. Again, this epsilon is the free space value. Okay? So you are expected to look up uh, to be, have the ability to look up constants. Uh, professor? Yeah, go ahead. So for this uh, situation, we use the DSC with the two bundle, uh, two yeah. yeah, two conductor bundle, yes. Mm -hmm. There, there's two of them in one bundle. So you may see three, you may see four, you may see many, but there are some equation you can find that will tell you the sort of geometric mean radius or the effective radius. Okay, other questions about this slide? Okay, so if not, let's do one example before we take a break. Okay, so, all right, so in this example, what we have is, we basically have uh, transpose lines. Okay, we have transpose lines. And uh, we have three phase, 345 kV lines, 200 kilometers long. We want to find the line to neutral conductance. And we're going to think of this as a bundle, right? We're going to think of this as two conductors bundled in all of them. The distance between these two is 0.4 meters. And the, radi the diameter of the conductor is 1.08 inches. OK, so we're going to try to compute the basically line to neutral capacitance, right? So our, we're basically going to find all the numbers to substitute into this equation up here to find the line to neutral, line to neutral capacitance, all right? So let's do this question. All right, so again, all these questions, the most tricky part is actually unit conversion. Okay. It would be nice if we could all agree to use metric units. But I've been told it is what it is, and uh, we're not going to switch conventions. So you have to deal with uh, unit convention. units. Okay, so if you take this course in some uh, in Canada, you will not have different units. But so let's convert the inch to meters, right? So since everything else is in meters except the conductor size. Let's convert that to meters and plug things in. Okay. So this is diameter is 1.108. So the radius is that divided by two times meter to inch per inch. So this is 0 0.0141 meters. Okay. So DSC is geometric mean between the radius you have in one of the conductor and the distance between the two conductors in a bundle. So this is radius 0 0.0141 times 0.4 comes out to be 0 0.075 meters. Then the equivalent distance between all three of them, right? So the equivalent distance is the cube root of DAB, D, DC, DAC, this is cube root of 10 times 10 times 20. Okay, so important is not 10 times 10 times 10, right? The distance between A to B is 10, B to C is 10, but from A to C is 20. Okay, so when you take the geometric mean, be careful that you don't have all the same numbers. See? underneath the cube root. Okay, so this is also a common mistake, right? You think, oh, everything's symmetrical, so it's all 10, that's not the case, right? So it's 10, 10, 20, that's the distance. Do this calculation, 12.6 meters. Then let's just substitute into our equation, the EQ over DSC. Uh, 
So, right, so, and multiply by the length of the line, so. Right, so we're computing this over a 200 kilometer long, long line. So this is the length of the line, right? So this is how long the line is. So what we have is two pi times 8.854, 10 to the minus 12, log of 0.6 divided by 0.75. This unit, so what's the unit of this first part, the first quantity when I'll compute it? What's the unit of this? It's important to know the unit of this because we need to multiply by the length of the line, right? So this is inferred per what? Is this in per meter or per, right? Ferret per meter, okay? So this is inferred per meters. So per meter, so we're gonna multiply by 200 kilometer line, line right? So we need to multiply by 200, multiply by a thousand, Right, to have meters, to have everything in terms of meters. This is 2.17 times 10 to the minus six ferrets. Right, so that's our that's the length of our line. Okay, so then we're gonna look at, okay, so this is the, the, absolute, num the absolute value of the capacitor. So let's look at what happens if you put it into a circuit. So we have emittance, right? So we're putting it into a 60 hertz circuit, we have emittance, we have some current, right? Charging this emittance, be consuming some, uh, or could be consuming some reactive power. So let's find the emittance, the charging current, and the reactive power, I guess, uh, supplied to, not supplied by. This is, yeah, supplied by. This reactive power supplied by. This uh, capacitance, supplied by this capacitance. So, as a reminder, we have CAN. This is 2.17 times 10 to the minus 6 farad. So, our emittance is J, Y is J omega CAN. Okay, so, you're plugging all these numbers. This is J 2 pi 60 times uh, CAN. This is J a point one nine times ten to the minus four simians. Oh, sorry, for Simmons. So Simmons. Then we have. So how do I compute the current going through this? Then, right. So remember, this is my capacitor. This is my capacitor. This has this has a value of y a n. And we want to compute the current going through this. Right, this is my charging current into the capacitor. So the equation we use, right? So what's the equation? The equation is y times v, right? right? So this is Ohm's law, basically. So the emittance times the voltage gives you the current. Right? So this is, you know, this comes from I is either v over z or y times v. Right? The emittance is one over the impedance. So why we know, why we know, this is 8.19 times 10 to the minus four. What is V? So we have three, four, 345 kV lot. What value should we use for V? Is this 345 or something else? So we just use 345, or should we use some other value? Uh, divide by square root of three to get the line to neutral. Right, when you line to neutral, right? So remember this is A to N, right? This is a phase line to neutral. So we need this to be line to neutral as well. So we need to convert this line to line voltage to line to neutral by dividing by root three. So this is 0 0.163 kiloamps per phase, right? So I guess this is the, for every phase, we have 0.163 kiloamps going through this capacitor, okay? 
Then the cube total power, the three phase power, this is y v square. Okay, so here we can, so the way we can do this is, so let, let's do this a little bit, let's do this carefully. Okay, let's do this carefully. Three times v a n times y a n squared. Okay, this is three times the single phase reactive power supply. This is three times one a times ten to the minus four times three forty five k v over root three whole thing squared. Okay, this is true. This is the equation we have. So the three and the root three square cancels out. Right in this case. So what we have left over is 8.19 minus 4, 345 kV squared. Because the threes cancels out, this is 97.5 megavar of reactive power. Okay. So is the capacitor supplying or consuming this power? Is it going into the system or coming out of the system? Supply, right? So capacitor in shunt supplies reactive power uh, because this y is a positive number. Okay, so right. So as a reminder, this supply. If you have a inductor, in this this is a because this will be withdrawing. This will be consuming. Consuming reactive power. Okay, so inductor consumes reactive power, capacitor supplies reactive power. That's why you see towards the end load, we often have a capacitor. Okay, we often have a capacitor that's shunt to close to the load because you want to supply reactive power at that point. You want to just give some boost to reactive power. Okay, so that's why you can put a capacitor. It's basically you if you connect capacitor to the ground or between the lines, you have some boost of your reactive power, okay? And that's why when you pay your bill, it's not, you only pay for active power, not reactive power. Okay, if you're allow, if you basically saying, if you're charged based on consuming reactive power, then what happens is you put a capacitor to the ground, you can make money. Uh, you can do nothing and make money. If somehow the billing is tied to, to the reactive power, okay? So, that's why your bill doesn't say only says kilowatt hour, does not say you know does not say volt amps, okay? Because it takes work to supply kilowatt, but does not take work to supply you know kilowatt, right? Does not take work to supply reactive power. So that's why we have this. Okay? All right. So a little bit the uh, last uh, things. Look at so one thing is what we have is if you look at this equation, basically if underground cables, underground cables tends to have a larger capacitance. Okay. And reason is just because uh, we cannot separate them as far. And we no longer have a free a free space epsilon. Okay, so if you look at underground cables, the epsilon is larger because it's in some insulated, right? It's some in, in some insulation, and that tends to have lar larger epsilon compared to air or free space. And they're closer because it's underground. We cannot put cables 10 meters away from each other underground. And they're packed relatively close to each other. Okay? The capacitance is larger. So what happens is the shunt capacitance of, of overhead lines. A lot of times when we do calculation, we actually don't include the capacitance. We just say, you know, some capacitance is probably small, let's not worry about it. But strong capacitance of underground cables, normally we have to include that when we do calculations. Okay, the underground cables will have some strong capacitance. All right. So in summary, basically our transmission line models we have equations for these. Okay, for these we have equations. Right, we have equations calculate the 
resistance per meter, the inductance per meter, the capacitance per meter. There is also a shunt conductance. For shunt conductance, if we have it, we'll just state what the value is. Because that's a slightly harder calculation to do. Shunt conductance come from the fact that once, once you have field, you also conduct a little bit current. And that current look, looks like it going through a resistor or some effect like that. That is normally very, very small. For most lines you'll see. Okay, for most lines you'll see this impact of this shunt resistor or shunt conductor. So this is what it looks like. This is typically small. Okay, and we'll ignore this most of the time. We won't worry about this value most of the time. We we you won't see lines enough, both are so high that this value will make a difference to any calculations you do later. Okay, we'll just you know sweep it under the rug most of the time and really need it, we'll just give some value. Okay. But we won't make an equation. The equation is complicated, and uh, you know, the value will be a tiny number anyways at the end of the day. Okay. All right, so this is our summary. Basically, we have the per meter models, and we can do per meter calculations. Okay. So then uh, let's take a break. Then what we'll do is we'll put all this together to get rid of the per meter part of this model. Okay, so we want to, we don't want a per meter model. We want a you know, give me a line that's three hundred kilometers long. I want the aggregate model, right? I want the lumped model. Okay, so the second half of this lecture will get will get rid of the fact that we're talking about per meter things, and we'll just look at the lumped quantum model. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's break to ten thirty eight. Okay, let's break to ten thirty eight. So I'll uh, I'll be back in two minutes. So I'll step away a little bit. I'll be back in two minutes to answer your questions. That's my half. Okay. All right. Otherwise, I'll see you back around ten thirty eight.
All right, so I'm back. Uh, any question about the homework or the class? You can ask. I have a question about homework problem number three. Uh, give me one second, let me pull it up. Okay, yes. So for calculating the power, I think we need to consolidate all of the uh, reactances into one. And to do so, do we need them all to have the same voltage base? No. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so you can put both into per unit terms, then just do the uh, normal things when you have two lines connecting parallel in per unit terms. Okay, thanks. Anyone else in Seattle here in that lightning? Yeah. <laughs> this is. So are you guys all in Seattle or in other parts of the country? I'm in Seattle. Yeah, I guess most of you are in Seattle still. So. Oh, someone's in Hawaii, yay. Uh, hi, Professor. Yeah. So you see the shunk capacitance of the line is uh, neglected, but the, for the cables cannot be neglected. Yes. The cable and the line is different. Oh, cable is underground cable, so let's be clear. So cable is short term for underground cable. Underground cable, and the line just the overhead line. Yeah, overhead line. So if we want, so sometimes we're lazy, we just say cables are lines. And mm -hmm. this implies that cable is underground, lines are overhead. Yeah. And the underground has the, the bigger the capacitance. Bigger capacitance, bigger capacitance. Okay.
Right, okay, so let's get started. I'm looking at the model of the lot. Okay, so what we did in the past few lectures is basically looking at a section of a line. Right, so if you think of a transmission line, the transmission line is something, you know, that's a long transmission line from one place to another place. Then if you look at a small section of it, it looks like this, right? Has a, a series resistance, has an inductor, capacitor there, a shunt capacitor, and a shunt resistor. Okay. So this is what we have for a section of the line. So if you put this together, what does the line look like? Right. What the line looks like is actually following. Okay. So a long line actually looks like this section. Right. Many of these sections connected together. So it looks like this thing to connect together, extending to you know along the length of the line. This is not what we want. Okay? This is not easy to work here because this is many small sections connect together, and that's not an easy thing you know easy circuit model to work with. So what we want is actually one big circuit. Right? We want is from the beginning to the end, just this. Okay. And we don't want many small sections of the circuit. We want one giant circuit like this. Okay, we want it lumped, so called a. Uh, we want, I guess, an aggregate. Okay. We don't want this sort of distributed things along the section of the line. We want one big giant circuit model that just represents the line. Okay. One, one giant big circuit model represents the line. And it turns out you cannot just multiply all these uh, numbers by the length of the line to get this lump model. Okay. It's not that simple. It's not quite that simple. Okay, right? So, for example, if you compute, you know, right? So, remember the last example we did, we saw, you know, the conductors uh, some you know some number per meter. It's not quite. You just multiply it by the length of the line. Okay, some little bit more work to get this lump circuit model, this aggregate circuit model. So let's do this, right? So, so to get an aggregate model, what we do is we do the following. Okay. So remember, we'll have, we have what we have is we have let's say we're looking at we're looking at the distance, so x, this is distance along the line. Okay, so we're looking at the line, we're looking at the distance along this line. We're gonna look at the voltage difference between a section of the line we, when you move a little bit delta x away. Okay, we're gonna look at all the differences how current change, how voltage change when you move delta x away. Okay, so we're going to move delta x. I'm going to look at what happens to the current and voltage. Right, we're going to try to set up some equations so we can understand, you know, when we have one section versus we continuously have this sort of small section of the line. Okay, this is our goal. Okay. Then for what are, what are all these values, right? So my inductor. So this is z times delta x because I have a per meter law series impedance. So when I move by small distance delta x away, this becomes together, these two becomes z delta x. Similarly, together, this two becomes y delta x. Okay, so we're moving delta x along and we're taking small steps. We cannot look at the entire length yet. But when we only move delta x, we can multiply by the per distance impedance and to get a you know the sort of the total impedance when you move delta x away. Okay, so we get this well, we get this sort of section model of the line. 
And now to analyze this, we're going to write KVL just for this section. Okay, so we're going to write KVL for this section. What we get by writing KVL is the following, right? So we know the change in voltage as V acts at the end of the line plus the impedance times the current, right? times current of the line. Okay, that's what we have. And then, if you rearrange terms, we have equals to Z times IX. Okay. Right? So we write KVL, rearrange terms. We get this number. And then we can take the limit as delta, right? So this is KVL, so we'll do uh, KCL. We'll do KCL okay, as well. We'll basically get two differential equations when you do, when do this. Okay, so this is KVL. Let's do KCL. KCL is on, on current. Okay? So the total current goes through a current divider. This is IX plus the amount of current. Right? So this is IX. So some other current goes here. How much current goes here? Well. We have y delta x times v x plus delta x. This is what we have. I'm going to assume v x plus delta x is roughly just v x. I'm going to assume that delta x is small enough that voltage doesn't change all that much. And then what I have is i x plus delta x minus ix over delta x is y times vx. Okay. So this is what, this is the difference equation we get. This is the difference equation we get. Then what we can do is we can take delta x to be small. Okay, so here we're going to take delta x, the limit going to zero, Right, this is what we this is what we do. Then we have dv dx. So this difference becomes a derivative. dv dx equals let's write this a bit carefully. Uh, small z. This is small z times i x. Okay. So this is a differential equation relating voltage to current. The differential equation relating voltage to current. Then if you take the limit here, the limit delta x goes, sorry, let's take the limit that delta x goes to zero. Then we have the derivative of the current respect to distance is y times v. Okay, y times v. So these are the two differential equations we have. So if you collect them together, if you put the two equations together, what we have is we have the derivative of voltage equal to a constant times current, derivative of current equal to a constant times voltage. We have these two equations. So these are called the transmission line differential equations. You can put them together to get a second order equation by taking a derivative again. Okay, this is a second order equation. Now if you put them like this, you have basically d squared vx minus the y times vx equals to zero. Okay, this is our differential equation we get. Right? So you look at each small section of the line and that let the section goes to zero, basically we'll have a differential equation. So our circuit model now becomes a differential equation. Anybody remember the name? of this differential equation? You should have seen this in physics class. Is the telegrapher equation? This is, this is called the telegrapher's equation, but this is a important second order equation, right? And they still remember. Right? So this is telegrapher's equation. This basically 
looks a version of the wave equation. There's some there's a second derivative of x minus a minus the minus the uh, function itself minus a constant tensor function. Okay. So this is a well-known equation in physics. You solve this equation all the time. So if you ever take a physics class, you'll be solving this kind of equation all the time. Okay, so this is a very well, very well known equation. You know, you can collect these two together with a gamma term, and uh, we can solve the equation. So to make your life easier, we're not going to do a lot of solving equations here. Okay, we're just going to know this can be solved. Okay, we can get a closed form solution to this. We can solve it if you really want to. Okay. What the solution ends up had to do with having a lot of uh, cosine and basically hyperbolic uh, sinusoids. Okay. Hyperbolic sinusoids. If you try to solve this, basically all the equation vx ix involves hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine terms. Okay. So if you solve it, this will be what the solution is. Okay. We won't solve it, but just keep in mind that these are the terms that are associated with the solution. Okay. And what this tells us at the end of the day, what we care about is, I have this, basically what we'll do is we'll basically when we have an equation, uh, d squared. So what happens is when we have a transmission line, have, let's say I have the transmission line governed by gamma squared. So gamma, remember gamma squared is square root of uh, z times y, gamma squared vx equal to zero. So my transmission line is governed by this equation in the box. Okay, this is my transmission line. What I'm going to represent by this equivalent circuit. And we're going to represent by this so-called equivalent pi model circuit. It's called a pi model because it looks like a pi. It looks like the Greek symbol pi. Okay, has a Impedance has two shunt emittances separate out each to the one end of the line. Okay. So if you solve this differential equation, it turns out you can pretend instead of a circuit with many small pieces, it's the same as the equivalent circuit with this pi model. Okay. And all you need to do is to match the terms. Okay. You do some symbol matching. Okay, to get this. Okay. And you, when you do symbol matching, when you do symbol matching, you have the following result. Okay, you have the following result. Basically, if you do symbol match, the equivalent z, right, the z prime that shows up in this, so let's draw this equivalent circuit again. Okay, so this is y prime over two. This is z prime, this another is y prime over two. So if you do symbol matching, your symbol matching will turn out to look like this. z prime will be this number. Okay, just if you solve the equation, it'll be this number. And remember gamma is square root of z times y. Okay, where z and y are your per unit lengths, okay, are your per unit lengths. All right, and you can write this in, the, in many, many different forms. But what you can do is you can think of this as z times L. This is how long you would naively, you would think the impedance is, right? You have a per unit, per unit, per meter impedance times the length of the line. So this is multiplied by the length of the line as small z times L. You have a correction term because we need to solve a differential equation. And it turns out solving this differential equation give you this correction term. And F1 is our correction term. 
And overall, when you look, lump the circuit together, you have Z prime. It's, so it's not quite per, unit, per meter impedance times the length of a line. What you have to do is you have the sort of associated term that comes out of it. You have a correction factor comes out of it. And the value, it is this value because this is the value you get for solving that uh, telegrapher's equation. Okay. That's our telegraph's equation. So all we need to do is to read this equation and know what symbol means what, and sort of understand we, have, we need a correction term. How we exactly get the correction term, if you're interested, you can go through the textbook or you can you know, Google online. There's many things solving those differential equations for you. For this class, for the interest of time, we won't be solving it. Uh, it's just some, basically, if you solve it, you get this correction term. Okay? So any questions about this, at least about how to use this equation? Uh, okay. <clears throat> Professor, so yeah, where is the small z? Where is the small z? Yes, because I see the z prime. That's the, the... So this is a small z, right? This is. Yes, yes. So what's this one related to the graph? Oh, this is just an impedance per meter times the length of the line. Right? So we've been doing this calculation for the past few classes, right? Remember, we did the impedance. We have the inductance calculation. We have the resistance calculation. So that goes to a small z, right? So z oh, is yeah. r plus j omega uh, f. Okay. Right, so this is ohm per meter, right? So this is all the calculation we've been doing. All right, so remember all the calculation we've been doing as in ohms per meter or farad per meter or Harry per meter, right? So that mm -hmm. gives us the distributed parameters, the per meter parameters. So we need to multiply by the length of the line and this other factor that comes out of it. So the small y is the uh, admittance per meter? Yeah, small y admittance, right? Small y, so small y as the g plus j uh, um, the c. b? Or, yeah. Okay. okay. Right, so this is seven per meter. How about the f1? f1 is just a factor, it's just a correction term. It comes out if you solve the differential equation. Mm. This comes out of it. Okay. Yeah. If you're interested, you know, you can. So the differential equation is not terribly difficult to solve because it's homogeneous, right? So if you look at this, this differential equation is actually quite nice, you know, for being a differential equation. It's an ordinary differential equation, as in a, as in a scalar variable, it's homogeneous. So it's actually quite simple to solve. And uh, it turns out the basic solution includes hyperbolic sign, hyperbolic cosine. So e to the x plus e to the minus x over two, this kind of terms. And uh, if you do the calculation, it is that, right? You do basically pattern matching. So basically we'll solve the circuit two ways. We'll solve the circuit pretending it's this model. We'll solve the circuit by solving the actual differential equation. We'll match the parameters until we get the same answer from both sides. And when you match the parameters this way, uh, this F1 correction term pops out, out of it. It's a correction term that comes out of it. So yeah, so not, not much more we can say at this point without solving the differential equation. So you won't be asked to solve this equation on the homework or on the final. You, but you will be asked to compute something like z prime. And uh, it's your job to you know, find this equation and use this equation. All right, so again, the important thing to remember, this is a hyperbolic sign, not a sign. Okay, but this is sort of mistake people sometimes make is they read this as a sign. This is not a sign. Okay, so for example, z prime should not really have a negative real part out of this. But a common mistake is you people tend to read this just as a sign. I'll be taking sign of some number and that number will be negative and uh, 
you know, it's just the equation, the answer would make sense, right? So this hyperbolic sign. Yeah. And I'm assuming you have a calculator or computer program that can do this calculation. I can do this calculation. Okay, any other questions about this? So we are supposed to calculate the Z prime and the Y prime, right? Yeah, so when we use it in a circuit calculation, we do Z prime and Y prime, right? Because these are the lumped parameters of the line. So if we pretend the long transmission line as a circuit, then the circuit will use uh, the Z prime, Y prime circuit. But to get these numbers, we need to go through this sort of Z prime calculation. Because what, when you buy a line, right, what does the line tell you? Line will tell you my per meter impedance as this number. Right? If they doesn't know, right? So the manufacturer of the line doesn't know how long this line will be used, right? How long this uh, your uh, transmission line is. So what you do is you need to take that per meter information, plug into this equation, and find z prime and y prime. So you're giving the values for the z and the y. Yeah, you give a small z and small y. Those depend on the manufacturer of the line. Okay. Z prime depend on length in a somewhat complicated way, right? Because else is inside this hyperbolic sign. So it's not just multiplying, it's just it sits here in a somewhat uh, weird way. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, so this is the equivalent Z prime part. Y prime uh, similar, right? You just have the, you can think of you have small Y times the length of the line. So L is the length of the line. Line here, L is the length of the line. Okay. So small y is the per meter emittance. You multiply by the length of a line, and you have this weird uh, factor, F2, associated with it. Okay, any questions for this? So when we model the transmission line, so we have the mm -hmm. right prime over two on the on the two side of the let's say. On the two side, on the two side, on both sides. On both sides. On both sides. On both sides. Yeah. Uh, if you have it on one side, it turns out you can't really match the parameter. You can't really do parameter matching, you have it only on one side. We have on both sides. Although for often for short lines, we'll ignore y prime. Turns out the value for y prime tends to be small. But if you we need to be correct, so there's a y prime on one side or two on one side, one prime or two on the other side, both sides. Yeah, and the, you know, F2 and F1, you should not read them. There's no deep mysteries into them. It's just whatever it turns out when you do the calculation, it just comes out this way. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, right, so basically, where the telegraph equation is some sort of wave equation, right, solving this wave equation. So, a little bit uh, aside relates to physics, right? So, for the people who have taken the uh, Electromagnetic waves and fields. So what way? So normally, when you do something, you have a propagation of waves, right? That goes back and forth inside your conductor. Here, what we're giving is basically the standing wave solution. So this is the solution of the equation when everything reaches steady state. When everything reaches steady state, you have this kind of parameter. Okay, so. And the reason we can do this is because of following, right? So if you do something, 
on the line. Let's say you change the voltage on the line, on one end of the line. What you have is actually you send the wave across this. And this wave bounces back and forth on this transmission line, actually, because as you know, it bounces back and forth. But it takes so little time for this to reach steady state that we never, mostly never cares about the electromagnetic dynamics on this line. And so for us, when we solve the equation, we're actually solving for the steady state, right? So we never care about this thing going back and forth. Okay? We never care about this thing going back and forth. Okay? So turns out the time scale there is so short that uh, for most operations, we don't care about. The only time you care about this thing going back and forth is when something like a lighting strike happens on the line. If lighting strikes a line, it creates this sort of back and forth wave propagation. Okay. That way, if you really design protection schemes for transmission line, you care about this. But otherwise, we, you can think of, you know, anytime you do a change on the line, the line the waves propagate so quickly or so quickly compared to the distance of the line that we just look at steady state behavior. Okay. Just look at steady state. So if you, you know if you're really into designing waveguides for uh, microwaves, then this is actually the just the standing wave. This is just the steady state equilibrium you'll get to. Okay? Uh, if you don't care about you know designing waveguides or this kind of wave phenomena, all you need to remember is these are the equations you look up. We want to look at the uh, when you look at what when you look want to look at the model of the line. So let's do one example. Let's do one example to see how we use these equations. All right, so let's do one example. As for example, let's say we're looking at uh, this thing. So let's take a, so 175 kV line, 60 hertz, 300 kilometer line. So we're going to completely transpose the line. So this is balance three phase. We're going to look at uh, the, so what we want to do is we want to find the equivalent pi model of the line, given this small z and the small y parameters. Okay, so remember equivalent pi model means find z prime, find y prime, okay, given small z. Small z. So this we can do this by simply putting on the equation, putting putting the equations into numbers, right? Okay, putting this into numbers. So that's what we do is remember z prime. If you go back to this equation, we can use uh, this this equation. Let's use z times f what equation? So z prime is small z times the length of the line times the correction factor f1. Okay. So here we have z times 300 kilometers times f1, where f1 is given by this correction factor. So this is hyperbolic sine gamma l over, let me just change it gamma L over gamma L, and gamma is the square root of z times y, small z times small y. Okay, so we can plug in all these numbers and basically figure out what the equivalent z prime is. Okay, so our job is figure out what the equivalent z prime is. Okay, so, Right, for again, for this question, there is not much to it except to know where to find out the numbers and pay attention to the units. Okay, so sometimes the units are given in per meter terms. Sometimes the units are given in per kilometer terms. Okay, so this is the difference we'll have from time to time. But other than that, not so much, uh, will be fairly simple to, other than that, everything else will be fairly simple to do. Okay. All right, so if you look at plugging those numbers, you do the final calculation, 
then what we have here is we just have this will be z prime. This will be 97 angle 87.2 degrees ohms. Okay, All right. And the hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine can handle complex numbers. There's no issue with complex numbers there. Okay, so these, these are fine. Then we have y prime over two or y prime. If you look at the equations, all right, so y prime over two, if you look at the equations, we simply have this equation, y times l times the correction factor. So this is small y times l over two times the correction factor, and you plug all the numbers in, you get 3.7, 10 to the minus seven plus j 7.095 and 10 to the minus four, okay? Simmons, okay? So this is what you get by plugging number. So really it is not much to this other than plugging numbers and uh, chuck through all the numbers. So really nothing very complicated. Although one thing to remember is even if small y is purely imaginary, is purely imaginary, the equivalent circuit, the equivalent pi model, the y prime number may have some real part associated with it. This may have some real part associated with it, right? And this is because when you look at the correction factor f1 and f2, you're basically taking the hyperbolic uh, sinusoids, so you have hyperbolic trick, trick functions with complex arguments. So may return both imaginary and real parts. Okay, so that's just something to be careful. Right? But so it's not always that y, even if y is purely imaginary, y prime, capital Y prime, may have some real part of the social world. Other than that, all the calculation is fairly straightforward. So any questions associated with this? Okay, so remember where to find the equations, right? So if you use a book, remember to know where to look in the book. If you're using slides, remember to know where to look in the slides. If you can find the equation, then the calculation is not too complicated. Okay? And uh, being engineers, even the equivalent pi model, we sometimes complain of being too hard. So there are some further simplification we can make, okay? So there's, uh, Basically, the philosophy is we're really lazy, and anytime we can make the model simpler, we'll make the model simpler. Okay, so in power system, you look, you typically have three types of lines. You have long, medium, and short lines. Okay. And uh, we classify long as lines longer than 250 kilometers, medium as between 80 and 250, short as under 80 kilometers. There are slightly different classifications depending on the exact distance of the lines, but normally there are three categories. And uh, so for different categories, we can make the model simpler if we want. Okay. So for really long lines, we need to use a full pi model. Okay, so you have correction factors, uh, you need to compute F1, F2. Okay, you need to do all this computation. Because the length, the length of the line is long enough that the correction factor starts to matter. Okay, so for long lines, plugging all the equations to everything. Turns out for medium lines, we can assume the correction factor is just one. Okay, so if it turns out for L fairly small, for L you know reasonably small. We can just forget the fact that we had a differential equation and do the simple thing. Okay, we can just multiply the per meter value by the length of the line and not worry about that we actually had to solve a differential equation. Okay, so we do the simpler thing. We don't do the correction factors. We use a pi model as well. Then for sure lines, we're really lazy. 
I'm just we're gonna ignore the shot. Okay, we're gonna be really lazy when we talk about short lines. We're gonna ignore the shot. We're gonna forget the fact that uh, there is a correction factor, and we'll just have a impedance for the line. Okay. And most times, when you look at the uh, for example, when you read the academic paper, we actually ignore the shunt, shunt branches. Okay, it makes things more tedious, doesn't really change the answer by all that much, so we'll ignore shunt. Okay. All right, so any questions about these three models? So for example, you may see a common question that says, for a short line, Compute the equivalent circuit model. That means use this. Okay, do not add on to it. It says for a medium length line, find the pi model. Means assume the correction factors are one. It says for a long transmission line, find the pi model. Means you need to find all the factors. So you need to do the full calculation of all the factors. Okay. So this is the terminology that is used very common. And this sort of adjectives, long, medium, short, has meaning. It has an impact to the value you use. Okay, so this is something that when you read the question, you should look at the adjective in front of the transmission line. Right? Is it long, medium, or short? So that matters for the value you get. So we sometimes have corona loss. For sometimes we have a for shunt resistance between the two lines. But this really only happens if you talk about really high voltage lines at a really long distance. So often we'll just ignore this factor altogether. Okay, for us, the corona loss is not terribly important and we ignore them you know, most of the time. We don't ignore them, we'll just uh, look at the or just, we don't ignore them, and when the value is needed, we'll just give you the value. It just be st the value will be stated to be what it is. Okay, so this will occur in a loss. And the last thing about transmission lines is it's important to understand the line limits, how much power you can push along the line. Okay, so we understand how much power you can push along the line. So there's actually three things that limit the amount of power can push along the line. What are the three things? The first one is what you know the what you think about as the thermal limit of the line. Right? So this is the thermal limit. Basically if I don't want to heat the line up very much. Okay, you don't want to heat the line. Okay. So again if you heat the line it's not the line melts, okay? The line doesn't melt. It's the line stacks too much or has something underneath it, okay? So current limit basically says if it's too hot, it will expand. The only way to go is to go down. And you want to avoid sagging very much on this line. That's why you have a current limit. And since most lines operate at you know fairly standard voltage levels, this is often given as a power limit as well. But you can carry so much power on the line because you want to avoid the sack. Okay? And this limits depend on the physical design of the line. One, the conductor type of the line. And the second, uh, the how much clearance you have underneath the line. So if you do a very good job of cutting trees, you have a larger sack under the line. You okay? have a large sack under the line. So this is the current limit. Turns out much of our Lines are not really constrained by the current limit rather than the voltage limit or than the stability limit. And these two are harder to understand or less obvious, less obvious, right? So what you have is, so we'll do this next lecture. This won't take very long, but it's useful to do this uh, carefully next lecture. Because later in the class, when we look at, when we're doing the power flow calculations, these will enter as well. So intuitively, what voltage limits does is, so if you think about voltage limit, what happens is if you have a very long line carrying some current, then naturally voltage drops along the line. 
Okay, so the voltage tends to drop, drop along the line. But we don't want the voltage to drop too much because the other end of the line probably have a transformer with some voltage rating. So you won't, don't want the voltage to drop so far below the voltage rating of the transformer along the line, on, on the other side of the line. Okay? So you can only push so much current su subject to a voltage limit. Stability limit is something similar, but we need to do more calculation to find the limits. Okay, so normally when the, how the line works is we'll build a line. We need to get the equivalent pi model for the line, and we need to get a limit on how much current we can push along the line. And these together describe the line completely. Okay, so we we'll describe the parameter of the line, or we'll describe the current limits on the line. So together it describes the, uh, the complete model of the line. We can use it in some powerful calculation later. Okay, so this is, so we'll stop here today. Next class, we'll do the uh, stability, basically mostly stability limit calculations. That's actually similar to the generator limits we'll, we'll do also. And after that, we'll really get into the large scale circuit, the matrix uh, vectors modeling of a large scale circuit. Okay, so we have uh, no questions. Uh, we'll stop here today. We'll see you next, I'll see you next Monday. If you have some question about the class or the, Homework, uh, please ask now, you can ask now. All right, thanks guys.